Good evening and welcome to the Mandel Leadership Fellows Capstone Presentations. The Mandel Family and Foundation have supported leadership development for decades, both here in the States and internationally. Their leadership legacy lives on in all of our Mandel School students, but in a special way with the Mandel Leadership Fellows. This is the capstone session for the eighth cohort of Mandel Leadership Fellows, and the second one being done remotely. In the past, we've done more traditional poster sessions, and perhaps next year we'll return to that format. I do want to make you aware that since this is a Zoom meeting, we are recording the event for future viewing. I'd like to begin this evening's program honoring our past by recognizing those present who are our alums, including some of our previous leadership fellows, and by celebrating our future by acknowledging those present who are our current and incoming students, including our new cohort 10 leadership fellows who will be joining us in August. Evidence-based and best practices are important leadership elements, not only in social work, but in many applied disciplines, such as medicine, psychology, business, and public health. In social work, best practices ultimately reflect the intersection of art and science, the blending of research rigor with deep human compassion. After all is said and done, our discipline applies its science through the vehicle of human relationships. In the final semester, fellows complete their culminating capstone project in conjunction with the course on evidence-based practice. The project is often done in concert with their field placements in which the fellows examine some aspect of best or evidence-based practice in an applied setting and typically make recommendations that can lead to practice innovations and improve or advance social work services or community supports. Our leadership uh, fellow mentors frequently serve as key supports and guides during the capstone process. This evening, our seven Mandel fellows present a compelling an innovative array of capstone projects. You will notice the diverse range of topics and interests reflecting the scope of both the student interest and the field of social work. The capstone flyer shows estimated times for every presentation and questions, each lasting approximately 20 minutes total including the last five minutes for questions, depending on time. If you wish to ask a question, click on the reactions tab at the bottom right of your screen and select the yellow raise hand icon just above the tab. Don't forget to unmute and identify yourself if you're called upon. Because of our tight timeline, the fellows can only answer a couple of questions. So please keep that in mind. We'll repeat the instructions at the end of each presentation for asking questions because people may be joining us at different times in order to view select capstone presentations. Feel free to contact fellows by email after the presentation, most likely in the following days if you have questions or would like to discuss their presentations further in more detail. Each of the fellows will leave their emails in the chat after they are finished presenting. I'm delighted to introduce our first presenter tonight. It's Ebony Clayton. She will be talking about promoting LGBTQ plus equity in youth drop-in centers. Ebony? All right, just give me a moment to share my screen. 
Okay. Ooh. All right. Good evening. My name is Ebony, as you know, and as promised, I will speak on promoting LGBTQ plus equity and drop in youth centers. I thank you for your time and your attention today. First, I will provide you with an outline for today's talk. I will explain the issue in context for my topic, highlight the vision of a drop in center for Cleveland, um, discuss the methodology of my specific project and close with a conversation about the facilitators, barriers, challenges and opportunities involved within the scope of my topic. As mentioned on the previous slide, the population of interest was queer young people of color experiencing homelessness. Why? While in general, young people require significant support to transition into adulthood successfully. However, young people of color who identify as LGBTQ and experience homelessness face many risks, making that transition into adulthood extremely difficult. Queer youth of color are more likely to become homeless due to family conflict, such as being kicked out of their home, involvement in child welfare or the juvenile justice system or mental health and substance use complications. According to the National Alliance to End Homelessness, on a single night in 2019, 35,038 unaccompanied youth were counted as homeless. They add that 89% of those young people were between the ages 18 and 24 and 11% were under age 18. Young people of color who experience homelessness are less likely to finish their education or obtain gainful employment. They are more likely to suffer psychologically or physically, leading to poor mental and physical health. Additionally, they may lack stable social support. As a result, while trying to navigate the world alone, they are subjected to physical violence and exploitation. Queer young people of color require tailored services to meet their needs, including identity and transition related supports, for example, access to medical care. Unfortunately, many LGBTQ plus young people of color face discrimination when they attempt to access services. Given how commonplace anti black and anti LGBTQ plus rhetoric is in America, queer youth of color may be turned away at the door or feel unsafe once sheltered. In addition, the literature acknowledging the differences between sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression continues to grow. However, such knowledge is not prioritized across care systems, leaving queer youth of color who experience homelessness especially vulnerable. Now that we've covered the issue and context for my topic, let's move forward. I will address each of the questions on this slide. To begin, the drop-in center model is a youth-specific intervention. Drop-in centers function to provide youth a safe and welcoming space to rest, acquire immediate access to their basic needs, and act as a third space to connect youth experiencing homelessness to supports and resources to meet their goals. Establishing trust and building and sustaining relationships is vital. Drop-in centers may contain laundry facilities, showers, a kitchen or food pantry, and provide on-site services, for example, housing navigation, medical and mental health care, et cetera. Guests do not reside at a drop-in center as they would at a shelter, but come and go as they wish. And center staff offers support and resources to guests. The literature indicates that young people prefer drop-in centers to shelters. In addition, Cleveland is the only metro major metropolitan area in the state without a drop-in youth center. As a result, A Place For Me, a collective impact organization working to end and prevent youth homelessness in Cuyahoga County, and where I proudly completed my field education this year, identified a need and desire for a drop-in youth center within the community. For instance, a community survey provided to over 35 providers and agencies indicated considerable support for a drop-in center to assist Cleveland's young people with achieving stability. In addition, a place for me's youth action board, REACH, is credited as the original visionary for developing a drop-in youth center for Cleveland. Subsequently, you see that there are two images on this slide. The first image on the top right outlines the vision for the Cleveland drop-in center the second image on the bottom right outlines the five core values which inform that vision. 
Now that we've discussed the vision, let's look ahead and contemplate action. As a staffing member on the drop-in center core planning team at A Place For Me, I contemplated how the five core values, specifically racial and LGBTQ plus equity, might be implemented in practice, asking what interventions exist that secure permanent exits from homelessness for youth, and do these interventions center on the Black or LGBTQ plus experience. In addition, I wondered how LGBTQ LGBTQ plus equity shows up within the Cleveland community and society as a whole. To understand this, I engaged the three specific tasks iterated on this slide. Before engaging in task one, I conducted a literature review researching the characteristics and needs of LGBTQ plus young people of color experiencing homelessness. I also reviewed legislation that would expand protections for the LGBTQ plus community and observed how frequently drop in centers appeared in the literature as a successful or preferred emergency and crisis response for young people. As expected, my research generated even more questions. So I coordinated with my field education team to connect with policy stakeholders and field agencies to help answer the questions raised by my research. Most specifically, I wanted to know what strategies in place promote LGBTQ plus equity and drop in youth centers, what barriers to implementation lead to disproportionate rates of homelessness episodes for queer youth of color, and what is still needed to secure fruitful pathways for queer young people of color to exit homelessness permanently. The following questions inform the construction of an interview guide related to the drop in center models theory of change. How does your facility or your agency facilitate positive initial contact with queer youth? How does your agency foster authentic youth engagement? And how does that engagement lead to acquisition of short-term, intermediate, and long-term goals for queer young people of color? I constructed a 15-question interview guide as well, reached out to 11 stakeholders, and completed six interviews. Among the stakeholders were a range of professionals, including two policy organizers, three directors, and one CEO. I reviewed the information exchange and conversation and identified recurring themes to formulate guiding principles on centering LGBTQ plus equity and drop-in youth centers, which we will go over later. All right. Before I begin wrapping up and discussing those facilitators, barriers, challenges, and opportunities related to my action, I will share a little bit about what I learned. This slide is a key takeaway. The information on this slide succinctly summarizes many of the themes pulled directly from the interviews I completed. For example, a question I asked each stakeholder is how you would define or describe LG LGBTQ plus equity. This slide sums up their answers. LGBTQ plus equity means prioritizing safety, affirming and validating everyone, and sharing an authentic and empowered participation. On this slide, you can see a table annotating some of the recurring themes and underlying principles that were imperative during the interviews. Themes include safety, affirmation and validation, empowerment, trust, relationships, understanding, empathy, among others. Guiding principles include normalizing the use of pronouns and chosen names, using inclusive language when developing policy, acknowledging the diversity of the LGBTQ plus community, understanding young people's lived experiences and increasing accountability for harm. Looking back at our outline, I will now disclose the implications relative to the scope of my topic. I have interpreted the views on this slide through an evidence-based practice lens. For instance, using a national implementation analysis tool to assess the facility of promoting LGBTQ plus equity and drop in youth centers, specifically in Cleveland, revealed capacity and evidence as the most critical factors to ponder. Capacity refers to implementation costs and the resources needed and available for implementation. And funding is always an element to consider. Moreover, determining which programs, services, and resources are initially prioritized to meet the needs of LGBTQ plus homeless young people of color best requires an appropriate allocation of dollars designated for that expressed purpose. Thus, public funding could be limited 
encouraging greater reliance on private and philanthropic capital. Additionally, evidence refers to the outcome, fidelity, and cost effectiveness data and strength of that evidence for whom and in what conditions regarding implementation. Although a growing body of literature concerning social inclusion or LGBTQ plus equity in schools exist, there is a considerable gap in the research investigating the implications of social inclusion within third spaces, such as congregate care settings or community-based systems of care. Researchers have begun this examination, but it is hardly enough. Despite these real and present structural barriers, organizations like A Place For Me do possess the capacity to engage community partners to secure the necessary funding to prioritize LGBTQ homeless use needs. A Place For Me can invite partners such as the Metro Health Clinic, AIDS Task Force, and the Cleveland LGBT Center to be connoisseurs on site on a regular basis or exclusively refer out to them. In addition, appointing professionals with lived experience to capture, analyze, and share data would redress those gaps in the research literature, amplify invisible resources, and strengthen care systems. Furthermore, there are currently no federal or state regulations in Ohio that include sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression as protected classes in civil rights law. However, the Equality Act at the federal level and Fairness Act in Ohio are pending. Both are necessary, especially since the validity of trans lives, especially young and black trans youth are continuously contested. Although many localities across the nation and 33 localities within Ohio, including Cuyahoga County, have begun to pass ordinances increasing LGBT protections, many efforts fell through in light of the pandemic. Finally, in recent years, attitudes towards member of the LGBT plus community have grown favorable. However, true liberation is a direct consequence of equitable policymaking. When our laws justifiably reflect our values and evolve in modern times, we become a more just society. I will close my presentation with the following. LGBTQ plus equity is not a new concept, but fully embracing it stands to be accomplished. The guidance provided in the research literature and offered by this presentation remains valuable. However, broad education is still necessary. People who are collectively willing to challenge their traditional understanding of gender and sexuality and prepare to divorce human identity from rigid categories manufactured by marginalized socialization will make the world a better place for all. Please visit the following websites to uncover additional resources and learn more about LGBTQ plus issues and LGBTQ plus youth homelessness. You can refer to the document that I'm going to provide in the chat for access to my reference list. I thank you so much for listening. And I'll remind you that I'll take questions now. Please use the reactions tab to raise your hand to ask a question or input your questions in the chat. Um, Dr. Hesse, I see that you're raising your hand. <laughs> Yes, uh, I am. I'm not sure uh, who else is, but I did want to ask you, uh, you talked about incorporating the, ex the experiences or the input into the planning mm -hmm. of people with lived experience. Can you talk a little bit more about doing that and some of the challenges and opportunities? So um, I can speak from direct experience. As I mentioned, I, I am a staffing member on the core planning team um, with A Place For Me. And um, we have, um, it's a 50-50 split. So there are 50% young people. Um, so about seven or eight of us. And then there are 50, about 50% 50 um, older adults um, or seasoned professionals, so to speak, on the team. And we engage in a process that uses um, consensus, um, but also deferring to whatever the young adult or youth majority says. Um, and th these, these are young people that have experienced homelessness. These are young people who um, identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community. So um, taking into consideration what they've experienced, what knowledge they have to offer and using that to inform um, how we come up with things like an operational plan for the drop-on center or how we come up with um, policy once we get to that point in the process um, is gonna be valuable. And um, that's a real life indication.
All right, I'm scanning to see if there are any other hands being raised and I don't see that right now. And I'm also looking at the chat to see if there have been any questions and put it and I don't see anything. I have a quick question. Go ahead, Gabriella. Um, so of all of your interviews and surveys and the work you did to understand you know, lived experience and perspective, mm -hmm. what was most surprising to you that you heard um, from those conversations? So I remember having a conversation with a policy organizer um, with the organization Equality Ohio, which is a nonpartisan organization um, who works to not only um, fight against bills that are being introduced or legislation that's being introduced that's harmful, um, but also to purport legislation that is gonna expand protections. And when I was talking with this person about um, the pending Ohio Fairness Act, um, she told me that this has been around for the last 20 years. I'm 25 years old, so that's like, almost um, like that's almost my entire life. And um, there being this assumption that these protections, so what the protections are is essentially um, wherever sex discrimination is mentioned in the uh, chapter 4112 of the Ohio Revised Code that you know it's sex discrimination is barred. The Ohio Fairness Act is purporting to add sexual orientation, gender identity and expression to, to be included and how sex discrimination is characterized. So that means you could not discriminate based on those categories. And I was surprised to know that that wasn't already like the case. Like, you know, I assumed that that was a thing already. And when she told me that, no, this has been going back and forth, being tossed back and forth for the last 20 years, um, that kind of blew my mind. Thank you for sharing. All right, <clears throat> Ebony, thank you so much. It's a wonderful uh, presentation. Our next presenter is Cheyenne DeShields. And the title of her capstone project is examining the roles and needs of VA occupational health providers in supporting workers, uh, worker mental health during COVID-19. Cheyenne? Hello, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen quickly. Oops. Okay. Hi, as Dr. Hussey mentioned, my name is Cheyenne DeShields. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I'm really excited to be, to be presenting in front of all of you today. So my topic is needs and roles of VA occupational health providers to support healthcare worker mental health during COVID-19. And so let's talk about COVID and healthcare workers for a second. Um, as we know, COVID has been such a transformative time for everyone, um, especially for healthcare workers. Um, as of 2020, there have been over 1,400 healthcare worker deaths, um, and those are just the ones that have been reported. And obviously, this is very stressful for this population. They've experienced mental health issues such as stress, anxiety, depression, um, and some long-term stress symptoms as well. So this has been just a difficult time um, in the lives of healthcare workers. And so our population, sorry, I'm not good. Okay. Um, our population is the Veterans Health Administration. Um, so this population also, healthcare workers here are not exempt from the stressors that come with coronavirus and everything that has gone on. Um, but the VA is a very unique population because it's the United States only national health care system and also the country's largest health care system. It serves over 9 million veterans and more than 500,000 health care workers. And as we can see from the VA um, map here, we can see that facilities span all across the country and U.S. territories as well. I just want to acknowledge my team um, before starting. So my project is part of a larger research team out of the VA Palo Alto and Stanford University. Um, so I just want to thank my team members. I think several of them are here with us today. 
um, and it's been a privilege to work with them. And I'm really excited to share what we've been working on and um, what we've come up with. And so for some background before we get started, what is employee occupational health or EOH as I refer it as um, from now on? So these are on-site healthcare providers at VHA facilities who take care of employees, trainees, and volunteers. So we have healthcare workers taking care of the veterans, um, managing everything with that, but then there also have to be on-site providers caring for those healthcare workers and other employees as well. So some of their roles include um, programs, policies around employee health and safety, treatment and prevention of work-related injuries, and just general um, adherence to different safety standards. Um, and also different roles in vaccine administration, infection prevention, um, and such. And so occupational health providers can be from a variety of disciplines. We have, we've interviewed physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses. Um, so they make up a wide range of occupations. So I wanna talk a bit about why we decided to do this project. We really saw the COVID-19 pandemic as the perfect time to highlight the work that EOH has been doing. This is a population that's not often thought about, but they're at very high risk when we're talking about COVID. Um, and so it's really important to know how their roles changed in COVID um, and what can we do to support them. Um, so this is a real time opportunity for us to really dig deep into employee occupational health. EOH has also had a really big role in COVID management. So they're responsible for determining whether employees and healthcare workers are eligible to return to work after they've had a COVID exposure. So anyone who's been exposed before returning to work, they have to consult with EOH. So obviously this puts EOH at very high risk for COVID infection and transmission. Um, so just to put another layer on why their role and why their work is so important. Just to talk a bit about our larger project. So we are aiming to understand the expanding and changing roles of EOH providers during COVID. So, so far we've interviewed um, since July, 2020. Um, and these are our themes that we found so far. My project is an expansion of theme number five, which is mental health needs. And so what we're trying to figure out with this current project is according to EOH providers, what are the most pressing mental health concerns that employees are experiencing? How does this affect EOH's role and what is being done by EOH to address these concerns? So I do wanna emphasize, cause sometimes this isn't clear. We're looking at the perspective of these EOH providers. So we're not interviewing the healthcare workers directly, but the people who care for these healthcare workers. So according to EOH, what are they hearing from employees about the mental health issues that are happening? For our methodology, we've done a literature search just to know what we can expect in our interviews when it comes to mental health issues. We've been interviewing since July, 2020, um, and our interviews focused on general needs, but for this project, we have coded um, in Atlas our mental health themes. Um, to see what are the specific mental health issues. And we hope to um, get this published over the summer. And so we were able to interview 43 occupational health providers in 29 sites all across the country. This sample was really diverse. This really gave us a comprehensive look at um, what are different experiences around the country for EOH providers in different VA facilities. And so we have had a range of um, occupations, doctors, nurse practitioners, nurses, genders, um, locations, sizes, and geographic types. So with our interview questions, we want to know what is the role, again, of occupational health um, in addressing these needs, and mostly um, what approaches are EOH providers implementing in order to support employee mental health? For our results, we came up with two main themes. Our first theme, we're looking at the employee's mental health 
needs. Um, and we'll explain a bit of it about this um, in a second. But our second theme is looking at what are the approaches that EOH providers are using to help employees manage their mental health. And so for our first theme, we really found that um, according to EOH providers, employees are experiencing a lot of anxiety, stress, fear about their family safety. Um, they're seeing things on the news and as the quote says, they're freaking out. They're wondering, how can I stay safe and what is the next step? Another mental health issue um, that employees are experiencing, according to EOH providers, is burnout. They're having increased work hours, really a lack of free time, and some really difficult work placements um, that are causing them to have some trauma reactions. And so one more mental health issue um, that employees are experiencing is bereavement. Um, as this quote says, there were a lot of um, patients that were lost to COVID, especially in the nursing homes, the CLC facilities. Um, so bereavement is another thing that employees have found themselves dealing with and that EOH has had to address in employees. So moving to our second theme, now we're looking at how is EOH resolving this problem? How are they supporting employees? One way that's been identified is the Employee Assistance Program or EAP. So this is um, free counseling services for employees. Um, they get a specified amount of sessions, um, sometimes for employees and their families, just to decompress, just to talk out everything that's happening. And this is again, a free resource that's available to employees. And so EOH providers found themselves in a role of letting employees know that this was available. Um, another approach that's been identified is whole health. Um, so whole health is a way of integrating physical and mental health using sometimes some alternative methods such as yoga, acupuncture, Tai Chi, really looking at that holistic perspective and how employees can address all aspects of health um, and including in that mental health. Um, so EOH providers highlighted whole health as another promising approach to support their employees. Lastly, EOH providers found themselves in a role of crisis management. Um, there were several employees, according to EOH, who experienced acute suicidal ideation on the job um, just because of all the stress that they were enduring. And so instead of referring employees to somewhere outside of the facility, they were able to treat employees in-house and get them the acute mental health care that they needed. And so what does all of this imply? There's several um, implications of what we found. First, the fact that mental health is not often an aspect of employee occupational health that is looked at. Um, a lot of times when you think of EOH, you think of, oh, vaccines, um, physicals, a lot of the physical health aspects. But the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted that mental health is an important part of employee wellness. And it really plays a huge role in just having the facility run smoothly. Secondly, um, EOH providers have taken on a lot of new roles when it comes to mental health. Um, and so we saw some of those in our results. Again, a whole health approach has been found to be helpful um, in supporting employees. Um, in addition, another, impo another important part of um, supporting employees is letting them know what resources are available because a lot of the times they're not aware. Um, and so just sharing that with people, whether it's through brochures or going around to different offices and just making themselves known, making themselves a presence um, and letting employees know that they're there to support. We also found that a combination of EAP and other services within the facility has proven helpful in supporting employees. Um, and so again, it's EOH's job to really see what's available in their facility, um, put everything together and then share it with their employees. Lastly, we saw in a lot of our interviews 
that in order to best support employee mental health, EOH providers have been collaborating with people from other disciplines, such as social work, psychology, um, substance abuse treatment. And so these are all departments that are doing their own work around mental health. And so EOH providers have found themselves collaborating with these people and seeing, okay, what is this department doing? What can we take from them that's going to help us with our work? Or what ways can we work together to get the most comprehensive care for employees? So in conclusion, we looked at the expanded roles and approaches of EOH providers, um, really looking at how things changed for this department, um, given the whole COVID pandemic. We found that it's important for EOH to enhance their team-based efforts, whether that's combining EAP and other interventions, or whether it's combining their work with other departments and seeing what can be done in that aspect. Another important addition is that um, it's really important for them to make referrals to EAP. Again, a lot of employees did not know that this resource was available. And so EOH providers are kind of that first line of contact when it comes to connecting employees to their mental health care. And so all in all, these findings can help not only EOH providers in VA facilities, but EOH providers in other facilities and professionals in other disciplines as well. It can help them to make more proactive steps in supporting mental health during COVID-19. Um, employee mental health is not often something that's considered, but when we have a crisis like COVID-19, we really see how this is crucial and this is really just necessary um, to keep, again, keep the facility running smoothly. And so before I end, I want to do my acknowledgements. I really want to thank my team. It's been a joy working with you all. Um, I wanted to share this picture. This just shows, you know, not only are we doing this groundbreaking research, but we're also having fun doing it. We enjoy being together. We enjoy all these things that we're finding. And we like to celebrate. So here we are celebrating um, my birthday a few weeks ago. And so that's been really meaningful for me. Um, as I've been working with this team since July, just to how we've gotten to know each other and how we've really um, just made this research real. It's really starting to not only be on paper, but now we can see how it's applying to real life. And so that's been really meaningful for me. Um, I also wanna thank Dr. Hussey and everyone in the Leadership Fellows Program. This has just been an amazing opportunity. Um, in the two years, they went too fast. <laughs> Um, I want to thank my Mandel School mentor, Cerise Jones, my field instructor, Melinda Wagner, for their emotional support um, as I was freaking out about this project. Um, they've really been a huge help to me. And everyone at my field placement um, at University Health and Counseling Services as well. Finally, I want to spread all of my love to my friends and family um, who have really just shaped me into the person I am today. Um, and I am eternally grateful. I can't even put it into words. So thank you all so much. I would love to take questions, comments. Um, again, if you could please use the hand raise function um, for our questions. Thank you. I'm gonna look in the chat quickly. Oh, I do see hands raised. Okay, I see Dr. Hussey, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to, as a researcher, this was really impressive. And I wanted to get your sense about the pace of this project because it moved so quickly and you're already uh, looking at your data and talking about publication. So can you comment a little bit on that? Yes, the process has been, depending on the month, fast and slow. So we did start in July 2020 with our interviews. Um, and that seemed to go at a pretty steady pace. Um, during that time, I was transcribing. So I was really getting to know this data. Now, this was before this semester, this current semester, um, where we decided, okay, let's expand on that fifth theme and look into mental health. Um, 
So when we started doing that, yes, that is where things really picked up because it was like, okay, now we're coding, we're coding for mental health. We're doing additional interviews, really honing in on that mental health aspect. Um, but I did really enjoy the fast paced nature of the last um, few months. It was a lot of work, but I really do feel like it helped me to solidify that data. So it's been, it's been a wild ride, but very interesting and an experience that I hadn't had before. Um, and I'm just really excited to work on publication over the summer and I'll keep everybody updated on how that's going. We have published um, the first round of results. So that's in the works. And now the mental health part um, is what's coming next. Thank you for your question. I see um, Maureen D. Hi. Well done. Well done, Cheyenne. You did a fabulous job. So I, I was uh, touched by the fact that the role of EOC, it sounds like they're more like a broker role other than addressing some direct um, concerns about the security or safety of the, the environment that the um, professionals are working in. Did you uh, encounter issues with boundaries? Like for instance, you know, one of the things that I wondered about, you know, they're not trained to be mental health professionals themselves they're uh, linking individuals to mental health professionals. I guess your research will show how well that works, but um, do you, did you run into situations where there might've been some boundary issues whereby the EOC staff themselves would take it upon themselves to, to develop a relationship with the employee around those, those concerns? That's an excellent question. Now I can just speak from my own research that I've been seeing just from the coding and listening to interviews. So that I didn't see, but now that you ask, I can see how that can be an issue. Um, it's, yeah, there's a thin line. You really have to be careful. Um, and as a social worker, you know, we always talk about not, not working outside of competence. And I do feel like that's something that could possibly happen. Um, which is really important what you mentioned, the broker role. So I think that if EOH providers can focus on that broker role, you know, getting those resources to the employees, um, relying on other departments to give them that mental health care. I think that that's the key to prevent those boundary issues. So that is something that as we continue interviews, um, I'll look for because that did not come to mind. Thank you. Well, thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Um, I know we only have time for a couple. I don't see any more questions. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was outstanding, Cheyenne. Our next presenter is Amanda Ferrante, and she's going to talk about the ABCs of sleep an ongoing effort to address infant mortality in NICU families. Amanda? Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. All right, hello, um, good evening. Thank you for being here. My name, as Dr. Hussey said, is Amanda Ferrante. Um, I am very excited to share my capstone with you today. Um, my capstone is focusing on efforts to promote safe sleep and address infant health disparities. Now, before we dive in, um, I do wanna recognize the heaviness of this content. Uh, if you feel that at any time you need to take a break or if you already know this topic is too heavy, I, I deeply encourage you to prioritize your own health and wellness in whatever way that looks like for you. Uh, this is an extremely heavy topic. So I wanna be mindful of that. So the prevalence of infant mortality or infant death within the first year of life is a common indicator of a community's health status. And this is not good for the United States. The United States has an infant mortality rate of 5.67, such that 5.67 infants die for every 1,000 live births. 
And this has declined significantly over time, but it has not declined at the pace of other wealthy nations. So for context, uh, infant mortality within the European Union as a whole is about 3.32. And on a state level, um, Ohio is ranked, has the ninth worst infant mortality rate with a rate of 6.94. And I pulled this visual from the Ohio Department of Health's annual report on infant mortality. And I think it's effective in displaying the uh, pretty drastic racial disparity uh, around this issue, both in Ohio and across our country. So that light blue line you can see in the middle of the chart is overall infant mortality in Ohio. You can see a gradual but consistent decline over the past 10 years with a current rate of 6.9. That green dotted line is our goal, 6.0. Uh, the gray line is infant mortality among white babies. Again, you can see that gradual um, but consistent decline over the past 10 years with a current rate of 5.1. And now the gold line up at the top, um, is infant mortality among black babies. This trend is extremely elevated and is more scattered where you don't see that decline. Um, and the current rate is 14.3, which indicates that black babies are three times more likely to die in Ohio compared to white babies. And rates are even worse in some counties in Ohio. So in our county in Cuyahoga, infant mortality rate is currently 8.6. And according to data published by First Year Cleveland, a local, which is a local organization uh, working to alleviate this public health crisis, black babies are four times more likely to die in their first year compared to white babies in Cuyahoga County. So this is the public health crisis we have on our hands. Uh, and it is not, it is not good. Um, so what's going on here? Uh, here are some of the leading causes of infant mortality. The primary cause far and away is premature, prematurity or early birth. Um, and these, this leads us to consider the influence of maternal health. Uh, and with racial disparities this severe, the question becomes, are there systemic factors furthering, promoting this crisis? Um, issues like do individuals and families have access to resources to meet their basic needs and sustain their health? Does mom have access to healthcare? What about transportation to get her to the doctor? What about flexibility at her job if she needs to take time off uh, in case she, when her pregnancy gets further along or if she needs to take time off to go to prenatal appointments? What about insurance? All of these areas affect her access to healthcare. The more equitable policies around housing, minimum wage, and these other categories could also improve health disparities such as this. Another part of this issue is the stressful nature of being a black woman in a terribly and historically racist country. Highly educated black women with advanced degrees are still more likely to experience the death of an infant than a white woman with a high school level education. So it's not just about access to resources. It's not just about income. There's something else going on here. And what's going on is the experience of racism. Witnessing and experiencing the violence of racism is traumatic and taxing on the body physiologically, and it can manifest as poor health outcomes. And this is just one horrifying example of that. And when you come into a NICU, these systematic factors are apparent. Um, a NICU is an intensive care unit for babies, a little um, uh, medical acronym, but these, these uh, factors are apparent. They're visible. The majority of mothers are either low income or women of color or both. So these are systemic issues that are the, the primary drivers in this public health crisis. Um, and we know these things will not change overnight. So while we continue to do advocacy in this area to create more equitable policies, uh, public health departments have also focused on reducing sleep-related death as well um, in an effort to more quickly reduce risk and reduce death. Um, so sleep-related death is connected to sudden infant death syndrome, also commonly known as SIDS. SIDS is unexpected death of an infant. It frequently happens in the sleep environment and it is frequently attributed to suffocation. So that's why we are gonna focus on specifically sleep-related deaths. Um, these deaths are seen as the most preventable uh, because they are seen as behavioral. So that's the, that's the angle of this whole initiative, behavioral change. So the American Academy of Pediatrics started coming out with recommendations on how to safely put an infant to sleep um, in the 90s or so. 
These recommendations have been distilled down to the ABCs of safe sleep. Babies should be alone, on their back, and in a crib. So discouraging placing a loose blanket over baby, discouraging placing a toy next to baby, and discouraging co-sleeping or having baby sleep with a caregiver or another family member in the same, in the same bed. Um, I've, I've worked in two different labor and delivery units, and I've seen this emphasis on safe sleep in practice. But knowing what I know about this larger public health crisis and how it is systemic, I've always been curious about the effectiveness of this focus, the effectiveness of this approach um, in this type of public health crisis, because we do direct so much funding and energy towards uh, alleviating sleep-related death. So to, um, I wanna share a little bit about a sleep-related intervention that was being implemented at my field placement. Uh, this year, I proudly served at, uh, with the medical team in the Cleveland Clinic Children's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit in Mayfield Heights. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic provides educational materials on safe sleep. They have their own, a bit of their own lingo. They have the ABCDEs of sleep. So baby alone, on their back, in a crib, but they also encourage parents not to smoke, caregivers not to smoke, because smoking increases instances, increases risk of SEDS. Um, and then caregivers should be practicing this every single time they put baby to bed. So we created a safe sleep kit initiative to, um, to enhance the standard of care in the NICU. And this intervention uh, includes components that align with current best practices around promoting safe sleep in this field. So we dis distributed these safe sleep kits to all NICU families when they were discharged. And each kit contains, consists of a couple of different components. So first there's the halo sleep sack. And this is a wearable blanket. You can see one pictured here on the screen. Um, it it uh, allows you to, to swaddle a baby and it reduces, in, um, reduces the likelihood that a parent would put a loose, a loose blanket in the crib with the baby. Uh, and providing infant supplies like a wearable blanket has been found to help promote knowledge, practice and communication around safe sleep. We also handed out uh, a baby book titled Sleep Baby Safe and Snug. And the intention was for caregivers to read this book to the baby. Interestingly, uh, children's books have been found to be a really meaningful avenue to provide public health information to families. Uh, recent studies with this book specifically actually show that when parents engage in the, the intimate experience of reading a book to a loved baby or a loved child, uh, particularly if they are reading this book repeatedly over the course of time, uh, and they may be prompted or more likely to engage in that health behavior that's contained in the book. So in this case, it would be safe sleep practices. And then in the kits, we also include a few handouts on practicing safe sleep uh, that were, that were uh, published by First Year Cleveland. And we, when we deliver these safe sleep kits, it, we have an opportunity for another intentional conversation around safe sleep. So clarifying what safe sleep is, addressing any barriers if any exist, answering questions if caregivers have questions um, to help promote the likelihood of, of uh, practicing safe sleep once they go home. So we began this intervention in October 2020 and as of mid-April we have handed out 128 safe sleep kits so we have had limited follow-up. This was meant to be a very light touch intervention. So there was limited structured follow-up with families once they are given the safe sleep kit and once they go home. Of course they get medical follow-up, but there was no specific follow-up related to the safe sleep kit. Um, as I said, interventions like these are, are very common and research does show that providing materials like these to families and creating another opportunity to discuss safe sleep greatly decreases instances of sleep-related death. But there are still a subset of families and caregivers who are not amenable to these types of interventions. Each year, about 3,500 infants die of sleep-related causes still. Often, these um, are driven by instances of, of risky co-sleeping. And co-sleeping is actually very common. One study found that 65% of surveyed families report co-sleeping with their infant within the infant's first three months of life, 65%. So in order to talk to families about safe sleep and reduce instances of co-sleeping, we need to understand why families are choosing to co-sleep. So I did some research. Uh, there's been some really great studies published on what parents consider when they're making decisions about sleep practices with their infants. And I compiled some of the common themes here on this slide and I wanna verbally highlight a few. 
So some care some caregivers believe that infants would be more comfortable and safer if the caregiver held the baby during the night. And this also alleviates anxiety for the caregiver. It's easier for them to check on the baby and it may also be easier for them to breastfeed. Some caregivers some caregivers feel like the baby goes to sleep easier and faster if they co-sleep and exhausted caregivers are willing to do quote unquote whatever it works to get baby to sleep especially during that early parenthood stage uh, some families see, co see co-sleeping as a family tradition this is how our family cares for infants this is what i've done with my older children this is what my mother did with me this is what has always worked for us and so the messaging that we typically present in the ABCs of sleep, this abstinence only approach, absolutely no co-sleeping, does come, comes across as judgmental and off-putting for some families, particularly those families who see co-sleeping as a typical practice. It closes the door rather than starting an important conversation. So with that in mind, how do we lean in with empathy to improve how we talk about safe sleep in a way that effectively reduces risks? So a risk mitigation approach in these conversations may be more effective than that abstinence only approach I mentioned earlier. If it becomes clear that a family values co-sleeping or intends to co-sleep, uh, continue the conversation by explaining the risks and also highlighting instances of heightened risk for infants. So co-sleeping is particularly risky when you have a, a premature baby or when baby is younger than three months old. Co-sleeping is also risky if a caregiver takes a, a substance or a medication that makes them drowsy, like sleep medication, um, it reduces their ability to have some, some self-awareness and bodily awareness in the night. And they may be more likely to roll or something. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Making sure the sleep environment, the sleep room is smoke-free because we know smoke in the air does increase the risk of SIDS. So having conversations catered to an individual's beliefs and values and then providing opportunities to reduce risk may be more effective in reducing instances of high risk co-sleeping uh, compared to that abstinence only no co-sleeping ever approach that may be seen as more judgmental by some families. And having multiple conversations throughout prenatal care and during the infant's life will be important too and checking in with families. And then we need to consider who is having these conversations. Is it a trusted practitioner that has built rapport with the families? Um, is it someone who has received formal training and coaching around how to have these conversations? Someone who has an understanding of why families may value co-sleeping so that they can lean into these conversations with empathy rather than with judgment. So if a family feels understood and respected rather than receiving a one-size-fits-all conversation, we may be able to further reduce risk in that area. But I do wanna close by centering, recentering us on the idea that infant mortality is a systematic issue that requires improvements to our social safety net. Knowing, knowing this will not happen overnight, um, what else can we do? So while we work towards improving overall community health, we can also work with families individually and with empathy to reduce risk and promote safe behaviors at home. It has been an honor and a joy to be a part of this school and to receive this fellowship. Uh, so many people in this, this virtual room have provided guidance and mentorship that I will always be grateful for. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I hope to work with many of you again soon. Uh, but before then, I would like to open the floor to questions. So what questions may you have? Dr. Hussey, I see your hand. Yes, that was great, Amanda. Um, Amanda, you really uh, have a very innovative perspective and you blend qualitative research with implementation science. Um, you're well aware that this is a light touch type of intervention, but you propose that there are identified high risk groups and that through your research um, and your conceptualization, you're suggesting that we could have tailored interventions, kind of in empathic risk reduction types of interventions for these high risk groups. I wonder if you could speak a little more about that because I find that incredibly innovative. About what these conversations could look like? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the first step is creating um, 
a, a department-wide training so that everyone who works in a labor and delivery unit, everyone who works in a NICU is knowledgeable about um, reasons why a family may choose to co-sleep and how can we talk about this in a risk with a risk reduction um, approach rather than this abstinence only approach. Um, right now, I think most hospitals do, they do provide training that it actually is uh, mandated by the state, but usually it comes in the form of like a handout or a video. Um, there have been some studies who have that have implemented department-wide trainings on um, how teaching staff members how they can talk about how to how they can promote safe sleep with families, and that's something I think that uh, would be helpful to hospital systems within Ohio, um, like the Cleveland Clinic, for example. Mari V, I see your hand. Hi, um, I was just wondering. Uh, if you got any like criticism or like constructive feedback um, on this model when you were using it um, in the hospital from patients, like from mothers, and um, if you have like what that looked like. Using a, uh, a risk reduction and having risk reduction focused conversations. Um, I think I, the only time I really received like negative feedback was, um, when a staff member was concerned that we were encouraging co-sleeping by not, by not having that, um, abstinence only approach. Um, there wasn't really an instance with a, a parent who was concerned about the, the risk reduction approach. It was more, um, having conversations with the staff about how can we uh, talk about this in a way that, that better brings in families and better engages families for a conversation around safe sleep rather than just gives them instructions and expects them to, to follow the instruction. Does that answer your question, Mani V? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just, uh, it popped in my brain. So I was just wondering if you heard anything, but that's, that's great to hear. Kwame, I'd love to hear your question. Yes, thank you, Amanda. Um, really wonderful presentation. Um, so the question I have is just, you know, um, thinking about your presentation and thinking about co-sleeping um, all together and attempting to conceptualize that um, within some of the theories of um, attachment theories that we have um, and in helping children develop, um, you know, secure attachments as they, grow into young people and adults, I am wondering, and I'm actually quite curious if co-sleeping at, you know, those very early stages um, work to sort of advance the development of these secure attachments, um, which is one, and um, whether or not when you look at it, you know, from um, your perspective, it could be from your research or it could be from, um, from some of the anecdotal experiences that you've had doing this work, um, just whether or not these benefits um, outweigh the risk and whether or not parents should, you know, that should come into consideration and in maybe future research also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You raise a very good point. And I did come across some research um, and some opinion pieces on how your how co-sleeping can help build a strong attachment between a caregiver and that infant, particularly in those first few very important months. So there are advocates out there, attachment um, folks who, who promote uh, attachment theory, who do advocate for co-sleeping in, in that early stage of life. Um, I think there are some, some middle grounds. Um, I know that some folks have created um, like small, they're almost like little beds that you put in the adult bed and the, the, the infant can sleep there. So if you do want that infant to be close, it still creates an independent sleep area for the baby, but they're still within your bed, so they're within your reach. It's also helpful for breastfeeding too, because there are a lot of breastfeeding advocates who, who do encourage co-sleeping because uh, it makes it easier for the mother. Um, so that, that is one middle ground uh, for that argument, but that is, that is a piece, uh, a part of this debate in this research. And I do think we need uh, more research in this area. Okay. Thank you. Amanda, Thank one, you. More, one more question. Sure, absolutely. Lexi, I see your hand. I'd love to hear your question. 
Yeah, Amanda, thank you so much for this really important work and the initiative. I'm wondering because there is a lot of work on the ground to address the high infant mortality rates, particularly amongst black babies in Cleveland, thinking about birthing beautiful communities that's doing such incredible work in our neighborhoods and supporting our families. And so I'm just wondering if there's been any discussion about what collaboration might look like across some of these organizations and other initiatives in the city. Um, thank you for that question. I think that's a, an excellent question. Um, we haven't done much, I have not noticed much collaboration between organizations like Birthing Beautiful Communities and these big hospital systems. Um, it seems like Birthing Be Beautiful Communities usually um, connects mothers with doulas and um, they kind of operate, it's my, my understanding is they operate kind of outside of the medical framework in, in, um, in, the, in the home visits that they do. But um, I think that would definitely improve care, especially when we think about some of the, the, fetal, metal, the fetal medicine clinics at the Cleveland Clinic, if they could partner with Birthing Beautiful Communities, we could really um, see some improved outcomes in this area. I'm glad you raised that organization. They are doing such great work in this, in this area, in this city. Great. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. Really appreciate that. Our next uh, presenter um, is Marvi Hal Arza. Um, and she's going to talk about narrative therapy for enhancing self-identity in non-binary adults. Marvi. Hi, everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Share. Okay, I'm going to move this out of the way so that I can see my presentation. All right. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Madi V. Halalarza. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I am obviously a graduating fellow and um, will be uh, graduating with my concentration in adult mental health and uh, getting a certificate in trauma-informed care. So that's a little bit about my background. Let me move ahead. So this um, is a little bit of a background on what we're talking about here with gender um, and gender identity. So first of all, gender is a spectrum of many different identities that somebody can have. It's not just being a man or a woman or a male or a female. Um, and so I wanted to take uh, this visual opportunity to kind of explain some different terms. So um, I'll just go through and share my um, identifications for each of these things. So my gender identity um, is how I feel and see myself. Um, so that includes um, me being a woman. I identify as a woman. Um, my sexual orientation has to do with who I'm attracted to emotionally or sexually, um, and I am attracted to men. Um, sex assigned at birth has to do with um, your biological sex, so I am female biologically, and um, I express myself uh, in my outer clothing, in the way that I, um, in the way that I dress, in the way that I carry myself as feminine, which is my gender expression. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit more about gender being a spectrum. So like I said, it's not male, female, man, woman, masculine, feminine. Um, there is a whole range of different identities that occur um, between being male and female outside of that realm. Um, some people might feel that they're different things at different times. Um, and so it, it really uh, is seen in society as two opposites, only those two options. Um, and that's really just not the way that it is um, in, in the world. So I first want to talk a little bit about um, what self-identity really means, because that is a little bit of a broad term uh, and, and could mean a lot of things. And within academia and my research, I actually found that a lot of people identify it um, or define it in different ways. So um, one definition that I found says that identity development involves the attainment of a sense of continuity across time and situation. 
So meaning that who the person is, what they care about, um, the things that they do, the things they like, the things they don't like, the things they want nothing to do with, um, that all um, should get to a sense where it stays the same across time and situation. And this uh, self-identity development is something that is hugely important in human development as we grow um, from babies to children, to adolescents, to young adults, to middle adults, to older adults, um, our sense of self-identity, especially in our societies here where we are more individualistic, self-identity is hugely important. Um, and this can be a very big problem if uh, people are not able to develop a very strong sense of their self-identity. It can have a lot of mental health impacts and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but as you can see, this table on the slide uh, gives some uh, examples of what questions somebody might be able to ask themselves uh, to figure out what their identity is. So I'm someone who's concerned about X. Um, something that I do is a very important part of who I am. Something that I don't do is rarely something that I even think about. So what do people not find important to them? So now I'm going to talk about the intervention that I researched. So narrative therapy um, is one of the first modalities of therapy to actually reject the idea that the therapist is the expert on the client's experiences and needs to explain them to them in order for them to move forward with their life or to fix any symptoms that they have. So it actually involves more of an open conversation and constructing of a story that can be done in many different ways. Um, and it has a lot of different uh, sub therapies uh, with different names such as testimonial therapy is one that I've worked with in the past. And they all have different methods of getting to the ultimate goal of having a narrative um, and being able to reflect on it. So then after you construct the narrative, whichever way you wanna do that, um, the therapist is gonna help the client to reflect upon their story and reframe its elements in a more empowering way. And then at the end of therapy, they will mark it with some kind of a graduation, a ceremony or other tangible event to help celebrate uh, the change and empowerment that the client has just experienced through the therapeutic process and help them move forward uh, in a productive way in their life. So some more background and context, what does non-binary mean? So a person um, who is non-binary gender is, does not identify as exclusively a man or a woman. They could identify as both a man or a woman, somewhere in between, no, nowhere on that uh, spectrum that we often see. Um, they could change, uh, you know, one day they might feel more feminine, another day they might feel more masculine. Um, it, it really just could be a lot of different things. Um, a lot of non-binary people also identify as transgender, um, but not all transgender people identify as non-binary. And the umbrella term non-binary uh, for gender identities includes a lot of other terms that you may have heard thrown around previously, like agender, meaning you don't feel like you have any gender, bigender being two things, um, gender queer, um, and gender fluid, meaning that that changes and fluctuates a little bit. Um, but these are just some examples of the very large breadth of identities and people that non-binary can encompass. So the scope of this problem uh, is honestly impossible to define because there is no way for us to figure out how many truly non-binary identifying individuals there are in the world because of a lot of discrimination. People don't want to come forward. People may not understand what it means to be non-binary and may not even recognize that in themselves because they haven't been introduced to that concept and maybe they just feel a little bit uncomfortable in their body. Um, there's lots of different reasons why we wouldn't be able to quantify that. But um, these are some of the numbers that I found in my research. 35% uh, of the 2015 uh, US transgender survey respondents identified themselves as non-binary or uh, one of the identities encompassed within the non-binary umbrella. Um, and 0.4% of uh, the study done in the UK um, with the 10,039 respondents uh, identified as non-binary. So neither of these are representative samples 
neither of them really give us much of an indication, but here are some numbers. And I really only focused on adults in high income countries uh, during this study because there is just not a lot of information on this topic in general, and especially not in low or middle income countries where there's still a big taboo around sexuality um, and uh, just not a lot of research, not a lot of um, talk on that subject. So in the future, it would be great to do more research with more diversity. So uh, finally, to round out the background, most people who identify as male or female understand what society expects of them, whether they choose to follow that prescription or not. They have a jumping off point that they can either fully or partially accept or reject. And society hasn't told people who identify as other genders what kinds of clothes they should wear, what jobs they should have, what activities they should enjoy, how dominant or submissive they should be. Um, and other than to discriminate really against um, them and tell them that they should really be binary, that they should find uh, a spot and stick to it. So um, this group is also just not represented in popular culture or mass media, and they often do not know what constitutes a normal non-binary, well, quote unquote normal, there's no such thing as normal, um, non-binary experience or identity, um, and they have to kind of figure that out for themselves. And for some people, this can be a really freeing, empowering, exciting opportunity to redefine themselves. But for a lot of other people, it's just scary. And uh, it can be really overwhelming, uncomfortable, um, and it can cause a lot of anxiety, depression, something called dysphoria, which is clinically significant distress caused when a person's assigned birth gender is not the same as the one that they identify with. It can also cause existential crisis, um, be a precursor to substance use disorders and lead to self-harm and even suicide in a lot of cases. Um, so this is something that really precipitates a lot of morbidity within this population. So the methodology of my project um, is that I did a literature review um, and looked at each of the topics that are listed on this slide and found uh, several articles that um, fit with what I was looking to understand. And I identified themes and common experiences among all of them. And then uh, only two of the articles that I found, and trust me, I scoured every resource I could possibly find, um, only two were narrative-based studies with non-binary adults. So that kind of gives you an idea of how really early we are in the process of understanding this group and what their experiences are. So first of all, non, uh, narrative therapy offers non-binary folks cultural humility. Um, and one of the um, biggest parts of cultural humility is uh, making sure that the other person, the person that you're serving knows that they're the expert in their own experience. And so um, one of the articles that I found said within the article, the powerful role of the therapist as a collaborator within with clients fits well with narrative therapy, especially in working with gender minority clients in which we join clients on a search for meaning, purpose and identity to attend to our clients with intentionality and curiosity. And that is ultimately what narrative therapy is and what this group needs from us in therapy. Um, and this kind of metaphor that I have here on this slide kind of explains that normally in therapy, we kind of think of the, uh, if, if therapy were a car, the therapist would be the driver and they would be helping the client get from point A to point B. In narrative therapy, it's the opposite. The client is the one in the driver's seat trying to get to a destination. Maybe they don't know what that destination is. Maybe they do, um, but maybe they don't know how to get there. Could be a lot of things. But the passenger, uh, you know, with the iPhone and the navigation and telling them, you know, take this exit, turn left, turn around, um, that is really what is um, helping the driver, but the client ultimately has the power to say, no, I'm not going to do that, or no, I don't feel that that is relevant. Um, and then also this treatment is extremely affirmative and empowering. Um, so it's, uh, it's very specific um, and, and purposeful 
uh, emphasis on being a safe space um, for people to be themselves. And it safeguards from previous clinicians uh, in the past who have been known to um, pretty much just invalidate and really be judgmental toward uh, their non-binary clients. And so this is something that kind of takes care of that um, as, as much as it possibly could. Um, so definitely helping to affirm those identities. And then a mechanism uh, for reversal of internalized negativity is also part of this. So um, narrative therapies focus on turning self-directed negativity into self-appreciation and kindness through the process of collaborative reframing offers non-binary adults a path to overcome these barriers to positive self-identity. Um, and we see some good quotes there um, from some of my articles I found. Um, and then also uh, another big issue that was discussed in the literature was body modification. So because this group uh, is not, you know, it could be fluid, maybe one day they feel masculine, another day fem feminine, um, maybe they don't know what really would need to change, if anything, about their body in order to reflect uh, the identity that they feel they are. It is a very big issue um, that a lot of non-binary clients have a hard time navigating. And so um, this is another great space um, for people to be able to explore that. Um, and one article described how participants ex appreciated the opportunity to explore these options, even when they found that none of them worked for them. And it's also simultaneously able to target other mental health symptoms uh, that the client is likely to have, such as trauma, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, et cetera, as it's been, uh, as narrative therapy has been validated for treatment in all of these areas. So it's a pretty well encompassing uh, therapy. So here, oh, apparently my slide's not moving. Here we go. Here is a um, depiction of some of the photos that were found in the first narrative-based uh, article that I found, um, a photo voice project where um, participants worked with the researcher to discuss issues that were important to them as non-binary individuals and take pictures that And then the next, slide is the second um, article that I found a lot of different quotes that come from that. Um, this article was a group based discussion. Um, there was one group in Canada and one group in Australia that worked together and kind of talked about issues that came up for all of the non-binary participants, um, what they felt like they needed to advocate for more, what would be empowering, um, what's really hard for them. And some of the um, thoughts that really stuck with me there were that um, if you know yourself, it's easier to set your rules, set your boundaries. And that is something that narrative therapy is really helpful in doing. Um, and it's also just helpful in affirming identity. And so um, the thought of that somebody would need to work really hard to remind themselves that they exist um, and, and that they need to be okay with their existence um, that's something that narrative therapy would be really helpful doing. So implications of this. Um, this, my thought going into this project is that individual therapy would be necessary for people to really in depth explore what their self identity is and how they wanna redefine that. But group work is really important with this group because um, there's a lot of uh, isolation and lack of community that happens with non-binary individuals, um, even within the LGBT community, um, LGBT plus, excuse me. So um, those, those individuals who are non-binary often feel um, that they are not part of that group because of um, the fluidity, the, the diversity there. And so finding them a good community support is really important. So peer support specialists being trained to do something adjacent to a narrative therapy intervention with them as part of a task shifting initiative might also be a really interesting thing to look into. Um, and then we really just need more research on this population in general, uh, on this topic with this population, what are the outcomes of this therapy? Neither of the uh, narrative-based studies I found focused on the outcomes at all. They just kind of focused on the process. Um, is there a specific curriculum of narrative therapy that we need to design specifically for this group? Are there ideal settings to carry this out? 
And then the advocacy piece that we need to do in order to make society more accepting and um, recognizing even the existence of this group is a really hard thing. And so if we get to that point, we might get to a point where this issue of self-identity is not as prevalent um, with this group. So how can you help? Um, you can share your gender pronouns. Uh, you can try to use more gender neutral words like folks and everyone. Um, you can use gender neutral pronouns like they, them, and their instead of saying girls and boys, ladies and gentlemen. Um, try not to call people um, sir or ma'am instead of just say excuse me if you need to get someone's attention. Um, and if you do misgender somebody, definitely apologize and correct yourself, but don't make a big deal of it. Just kind of keep moving forward. Um, and, and just pledge to do better next time because it's okay, it is confusing. We all slip up and, and as long as you're doing your best, um, that is something that is, is really great in itself. Um, so yeah, here's references and I don't even know if we have time for questions, but um, go ahead and ask them if you have them. Take, we can take one question. Does anyone have a question? If not, I do. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Hussey. So in your, in your time at the Mandel School, you've studied, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 different types of therapies. Right. So you've been exposed to quite a few. Why did you choose narrative therapy and not another type of therapy, particularly a more common type of therapy? So um, one of the main things is that, so of course in social work, we're, we're learning in social work school that we are supposed to always allow the client to be the driver of the therapy. Um, and that is something that wasn't always the case in the past. Um, but I think that even with that caveat, a lot of other therapies um, like CBT or um, DBT, uh, other interventions that are a little bit more seasoned uh, than narrative therapy have a lot of emphasis on the skill of the clinician and specific pathways to getting the outcome of the therapy to happen. And narrative therapy is so great because it's so broad that it can be driven by the client in a way that allows them to redefine their personal um, you know, view of themselves. And no clinician is gonna be able to help somebody do that if they're in charge. And I think that that is not something that is always the case in the other therapies. So that, that was just my thought on that. Great. I wonder maybe just a quick question from Maureen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to acknowledge that this is a hugely important er area that you've uncovered, I think, that that impacts mental health, because the more that we read and learn about self-identity, the more we understand the impact on self-image and self self-loathing right mm -hmm. so I I think you're onto something really huge and I think it would be very interesting to actually practice uh, this theory of using narrative therapy and seeing the impact on outcomes such as suicide rates and um, you know uh, uh, the the areas of um, uh, you know drug addiction and um, you know, other, other behaviors that are problematic for this popu for a population that doesn't fit into a standard norm. So yeah, I think this is huge. Thank you so much for sharing and for the research you've done on this, Marie-V. Mar Absolutely. Thank you so much. I agree completely. And um, this is actually, I, I was inspired to do this topic because I had a non-binary client in my field placement. Um, and I decided to take a narrative therapy approach to it and it had really good results. So um, definitely not uh, you know, enough to generalize to the whole population, but definitely thoughts to move forward with research for sure. And thank you, Maureen, for being such a great mentor to me for the past couple of years. You've been fabulous. My pleasure. 
Great, excellent job. All right, our uh, next presenter is Lexi Lattimore and her capstone project is choreographing space for justice, a healing centered model for community led change. Lexi. Hello, everyone. Let me just get this set up here. I am so excited to talk with you today about choreographing space for justice, a healing centered model for community led change. Again, my name is Lexi Latimore and taking a big cue from Marivi and all she's taught us, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am an artist and a social worker. Artistically, I am a dancer, storyteller, mover, writer. And in my social work practice, I work at the neighborhood level, building community through the arts to address systems of oppression that have created cycles of trauma. Speaking of which, speaking of trauma, last year, an article came out that ranked Cleveland the worst city for Black women to live in America. I am a Black woman and I live in Cleveland and I'm actually the fourth generation of Black women who have also lived in Cleveland in my family. So this article was not only striking and disturbing, it really informed how I was looking at some of my work in the field. One, one important thing to note is that Cleveland is not only ranked one of the worst cities for black women to live in in America, it's also one of the most segregated cities in the country. There's, in my view, something to consider here. And as we look at racially explicit laws and policies like redlining, for example, we can see that so many of, of the, the maps in this um, nationwide system of urban ghettos that have been created, how that's impacting particularly women and girls on the ground. Legal segregation we know has led to what I call complex community trauma. So I, I like to look at this web of ways that folks are experiencing oppression and potential traumatic response um, from place-based trauma due to structural violence, like the redlining that we just talked about, to unresolved grief from historical trauma, thinking about um, the fact that there are a number of, of African-American folks of slave descent who are living in Cleveland and, and all across the US, and that intergenerational trauma of that traumatic stress being passed down to offspring via things like parenting style. So I wanna zoom out a little bit and talk about black women and girls and how they are doing statistically in the data across the country. But before I do that, I want to invite all of you to take care of yourself. Um, Miller Karras calls this a resiliency pause. I like to just say, hold up, <laughs> let's take a moment. Um, some of these stats are really upsetting. And as many of us share parts of this in our lived experience, I just wanna give you complete permission and encouragement to take the break that you need, to take the moment that you need as we go through this. So we know, um, we know that, that Black women and girls are one of the most civically engaged groups across the country. In the last two elections, Black women were the, um, were the most active participant out of any other group. So there's a civic engagement that we see in their organizing, in their voting patterns, and um, we also know that they're incredibly active in the workforce. 62.2% of black women are in the workforce. And really, really important to note, 80.6% of black families are led by a female breadwinner. So thinking about these family dynamics and the, part, and the fact that an overwhelming majority of black families are depending on black women's labor for their survival. A quarter of black women, 24.6% are living in poverty versus 18.9% of black men and 10.8% of white women. 
domestic violence rates. 40% um, of Black women will experience domestic violence, will experience um, physical violence at the hands of an intimate partner in their lifetime. One fourth of Black girls will experience or will be sexually assaulted before 18. One fifth of Black women are survivors of rape. And 40 to 60% of Black girls uh, will be victimized by coercive sexual contact by 18. We learned from Amanda earlier today that infant mortality rates amongst Black women are, are really terrible. Um, black babies are three times more likely to, to die in infancy than, than white babies. And we also know that our transgender women, our Black trans women are not um, doing, as, doing so well as well. Um, by 2019, in November, at least 22 trans people had been murdered, 91% of them were Black women, and 81% were under 30. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. So take a moment. Take a moment. I, bearing all of this in mind, I am really excited to build a model that is healing-centered, that centers Black women and teenage girls, in an effort to support them in improving their neighborhoods while addressing individual and complex community trauma. I've come up with a 12 session model, again, that centers black women and girls to support them in making neighborhood change that would be healing for generations to come. The model takes after the literature of Dr. Judith Herman who writes a great book called Trauma and Recovery uh, Herman talks a lot about the essential nature of trust and empowerment in a recovery process. She writes that um, the survivor must be the author and arbiter of her own recovery. And just thinking about the nuanced way that trauma damages the patient's ability to enter into trusting relationships and that recovery must occur in the context of relationships. So this is really a community-based collective model that I'm working on here. Um, Herman talks about three phases of recovery. The first being to reestablish safety. Survivors, she says, feel unsafe in their bodies and unsafe in relation to other people. So establishing that safety is the first step before any other part of the healing process can begin. After that, survivors are able to begin putting together their trauma narrative or beginning to tell their story. In, in the case of this model, we do not do trauma narrative work, um, but that is an important piece to Herman. And I'll talk a little bit about what we are proposing to do. Um, and Herman points out that trauma inevitably brings loss. And often this loss is overwhelming and we don't have many proper rituals, if you will, to really honor and mourn those losses. And um, it, it once we're able to get through that morning, it allows for the survivor to, to reconnect and to reclaim her world. So choreographing space has four sessions per theme, the safety, storytelling, and reconnection. And just as a note about safety, if participants are not ready to move on beyond that safety unit at the, at the top, um, we will continue on in that realm until that safety has really been established. So regarding safety in those sessions, we are thinking about safety in relation to our bodies, in relation to self, others, and the environment. There's a whole host of trauma education that is shared um, and just general discussions about safety in these various contexts, contexts well-being, and body safety. In our storytelling, we're really looking to develop individual and collective narratives. And throughout that narrative building process, it's really important um, to keep track of what some of those resounding themes of loss are. And participants are able to build a mourning ritual, um, a ritual together in which they really make space to honor and acknowledge those losses. And that, that leads us to this reconnection phase of um, being able to envision a brighter future. We use collective visioning. Um, participants are encouraged to create either a neighborhood healing plan 
or if this is coming right before a larger development process to utilize, to create action plans that could inform the work of that development and to leave with you know, a, a self-care plan per participant. So I love this quote by the incredible activist organizer, Miriam Kaba, who says, what can we imagine for ourselves and the world? The overall session design flows in the way of a general technique dance class. We're not learning dance technique. I can, I can assure you of that. However, each session begins with a warm up. There's a center activity and a cool down. Um, within that, you can see that it, it flows between mind, body, and spirit. So we'll do a check-in for the mind and the warm up, a physical warm up, getting the body warm and the juices flowing, and, and then um, doing some sort of spirit activating activity, whether that's singing, it might be meditating or praying. And you can see how this flows throughout the rest of the sessions that in the center we're talking, we're doing that storytelling, we're bringing some of those stories to life with the body, and then providing space for reflection and processing at the end. Same for the cool down, we do a checkout, cool down and meditation. And regarding this mind-body approach, um, you might be wondering, is this just because, is this a woo-woo, Lexi likes to dance and wants everyone to dance? Which perhaps I do, but um, this is really directly from the literature. Dr. Basil van der Kolk um, writes an incredible book, The Body Keeps the Score. And in it, he talks about the neuroscience of trauma, how it impacts the brain, how that brain connection can di be disrupted with the body and, and literally physical sensations in the body and how that ruptures the spirit. So he talks about the necessity of befriending the sensations in the body in order to do this work. Peter Levin um, has written so much since 1997, but this was his breakout text called Waking the Tiger. And in it, he explores animal behavior our, the lower part of our brain, the reptilian and mammalian part in our brain stem respond very similarly to animals. When we have a fight, flight or freeze response in, in response to a huge threat, it is instinctual, just like an animal would respond. What he noticed was that in, in his studying of animals, uh, they're normally able to fight or to flee, but when they're not, when they are rendered captive or helpless or frozen, that residual energy gets trapped that, it, that they would have been using to run or to, to fight. After the threat is gone and they've survived, they go through a process of literally shaking and trembling to dispel that energy and resolve it within the body. As we know in humans, if we are unable to fight or flee, if we are held captive or helpless in the face of overwhelming threat, and we are, have a freeze response, that residual energy is often not discharged. And so what it does is it gets trapped in the nervous system and it can wreak havoc on our bodies and our spirits. And it is essential to create a welcoming system of support to really realign that mind, body, spirit connection. And that's exactly what Choreographing Space for Justice aims to do. It's an embodied approach to healing that helps move energy through the body. In terms of next steps, this is really just the beginning, um, but there are a number of implementation considerations. I would like to pilot this model and evaluate it and really refine the best practice that the best practices, excuse me, that are coming out of the literature and see how they really measure up in the field. And I'm interested in starting to understand if this could also apply to other populations. So as we're working with groups of black women, groups of black teenage girls, could this also work for other populations that are experiencing forms of oppression, particularly due to some form of, um, of place-based legal segregation? I'm so grateful to, to spend time today. And I just want to thank every single one of you, but particularly highlight the folks on this slide um, to Dr. Hussey and Ms. Paula, my mentor, to Dean Sharon Milligan, who I started this research with over a year ago, to Kwame Bachwe, who I would not be presenting um, without him leaving his readings on my kitchen table many moons ago and encouraging me to be at the Mendel School. 
um, to my mentors in the field, Dr. Chup and Tom O'Brien, and to my family and school community. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you to my Cleveland community and all the black women in Cleveland, especially who are holding it down and making so much happen on very little resource, but with such flair and pride and pizzazz. I thank you so much. I'm going to pause to open it up for questions. I know that we have limited time. Um, we just have five minutes now. And um, if you have additional questions that we don't get to, this is my email, my phone number and media information. I'll drop it in the chat for you. But thank you so, so much. Some questions. I have a I have a comment. Sure, Miss Gwen. Okay. Ah, oh, this was great. A great presentation. In fact, all three of them were. Um, Lexi, how can I join what you're doing? That's what I want to. You know, yeah. that's what I want to know. <laughs> Thank you for that that question. Um, I will be in touch and I will certainly share my information in the chat as well. I would love this. This can only happen within collaboration. So I'm really grateful to, to all of you for being on the call and would love um, thought support as well as implementation support when it's time. So Ms. Gwen, I will be calling you. Any other questions, Dr. Chup? I see you have a hand raised. Lexi, fabulous presentation. Thank you. I, I do have a question, and that is, uh, if you not if you're not Lexi Lattimore, how can a social work change agent uh, implement some of the work that you're proposing here? Because I think it's a powerful model. And so, how how can we learn from that and and apply it to other settings? Yeah. Thank you for this. Uh, Question, Dr. Chup, and to be honest with you, I've had to think about this often of like, is this something that a non-dancer could do? Is this something something that, that could be utilized in other contexts? I definitely think it is. Um, I think it could work with facilitation and partnership, at least with one person who has body-based work that could be in yoga, that could be in theater or another discipline. I think you would need to be comfortable leading movement, at least one of the facilitators, because we're asking others to step out of their comfort zone with us and to re-engage with the body. Um, but I think ultimately this is a model that could work with multiple facilitators um, who have various forms of skill that could really usher this group through this process. Um, so thank you for raising that question because that's something I've thought about a lot. All right, uh, Lexi, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, our next presenter, uh, Mai Sigawa, will be talking about the Rainbow Life Goal Setting Activity for Children. Mai? Thank you, Dr. Hussey. Can everybody see my screen? I hope that's a guess. Yes, you're good. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so today I will be presenting to you uh, the three-step Rainbow Life Goal Setting Activity Kit. So I wanted to show you a picture of the actual kits. Um, so I created a, um, in conjunction with my supervisor, Irene Baus, who is here today, um, I created this art kit for children um, to help them set goals. And right now I'm at the UH Rainbow Babies Children's Hospital. That was my field placement um, for my final year here. And I was at the craniofacial unit and we wanted to create a age appropriate um, goal setting activity for children for them to live a full and healthy life. Um, so what's included in the kit are several things. Um, so I have a wheel, a rainbow wheel, and I'll explain all of this uh, right after this slide, but I just wanted to make sure you saw it. Um, there's these staircase gold cards that are also handmade. Um, crayons, pens, stickers, 
and the instructions. So I wanted to give you a background of where my internship is and what it's all about. Um, the patients that we see, we see patients from birth until 21 years old, sometimes a little older, especially if they want to come back for checkups. But many of our patients have some sort of craniofacial abnormality. So what that means is they have a problem with something with their mouth, um, if, whether that's cleft palate or something with their head, if, if um, they might have craniosynostosis, which means that their heads are a little bit misshapen so that uh, there's a lot of pressure in there. So it's quite dangerous. So some, many of these children need surgery immediately. Sometimes they need surgery multiple times a year. So um, it's quite traumatic for them, for some of the kids. And we wanted to create um, an activity where the child can express their needs. So sometimes I think what happens during um, assessment, even though we always try to do a thorough assessment of the child, um, things that are extra might not be considered just because of the short time that we have with the child. So we might not be able to get the full picture. We might not be able to know their favorite, you know, extracurricular activity. Maybe we will be able to ask them about that, but sometimes the voice of the child is lost. So we wanted to make sure that we created something nice and fun for the children, especially during COVID. So these kids were actually, um, we only, I was only able to send some of them, right, um, to the kids, but I was able to send the kids to a few children. So the Rainbow Life activity for children, um, I wanted to give you an overview of the purpose. So it really is to help children um, see their life, perhaps for the first time in categories. Um, and we wanted to ensure that all of the five domains were included. So we consulted with um, the pediatrician, um, the child psychologist, and we really modify this activity uh, for children to make it developmentally appropriate. So the five categories, as you can see, are color-coded. It's family, health, extracurricular, school, and friends. And we hope that by making sure that these children engage in these categories of their life through setting goals, that they can have a fuller, happier life. Um, and also, um, because the voices of the children are not always heard, just because the parents might be exhausted with COVID, there's been a lot of issues regarding finance concerns and things like that. Um, we wanted to create something that the child could even do on their own. So I'm gonna go walk you through the three-step process. Um, the first step is understanding the colors, uh, the power of full life resiliency. So the idea is when you see your life in categories, even if you have a bad day in one area of your life, you can know that you have other areas of your life to support you. So for our population, because the children look different, many times they have trouble making friends. That's a common issue for us. Um, and so by being able to almost train children to kind of, you know, make sure that um, from a young age, they're able to like see things in categories, like, you know, today I, I just felt like, you know, I was, I was feeling sad. I didn't, I wasn't able to, um, talk with someone I really wanted to talk with, like you can work on those goals um, with a therapist or you can work on those goals with a parent. Um, but sometimes I think it's hard for children to kind of like conceptualize their life. So um, this activity really also was inspired by like situations that I saw in clinic. So my supervisor was really um, quick to point out, you know, sometimes the parent will say something like, I would really like my child to have more friends. Um, and one of the advice uh, that my supervisor recommended was that um, 
that the child could work on like social skills and actually you could set a goal with the therapist um, to work on that area of your life. Um, so, so that's something that I really wanted to um, emphasize. And also, uh, so this activity, it's not necessarily only for children. Um, this idea uh, also came about when I um, was taking the child trauma class um, with Amy Korsh and I had to create a self-care activity. Uh, and for me, I found through research that in order to protect yourself from secondary trauma, even as social workers, the best way to do so is to be able to live a full life. Um, so you have to have a life outside of school. You have to have a life outside of work. And even after you witness trauma, uh, the National uh, Trauma Network, they recommended that um, the best course of action really is to have a life outside of the workplace where you witness a trauma. So uh, truly this model is really applicable to not just children, but for all ages. So one of the key active ingredients, I should say, of this model is understanding why each category is important to a child's life. So a very simplistic way that I laid it out, and uh, this was actually, um, this, this curriculum was co-created with my supervisor. So she did have a lot of input in this section here. Um, good family equals good supports. Um, and you describe why is family important? And you ask the child as well, why do you think family is important? And children are able to say, uh, my mom's always there for me. Um, and why is good schooling important? It's good schooling is important so that you can get a good career. You can do what you love in the future. Um, why are friends important? You know, friends are people that you have fun with. So very like simple things like this, but um, even for health, why is it important to be healthy? If you're sick, you can't go to school. Um, you can't have fun, you can't play sports. Um, so it's a nice way for children to kind of understand why each category is essential to their life. So I created these goal setting staircase um, cards and um, there is a power in self setting your goals. Um, so there's this study that was done that showed how kids with learning disabilities actually did better when they were able to set the goals themselves instead of a teacher setting the goals for them. So um, this, I tried to make it as easy as possible for the kids, but basically the idea is you write your dream goal at the top of the staircase, and then you think backwards and you think about the many goals that you have to do to get to the big goal. And so this really utilizes not just the child's imagination, but it, it also utilizes critical thinking skills. So for this uh, particular goal for extracurricular activities, if you wanted to learn a new language, um, the first thing you might have to do is to tell mom. Um, and the second thing, you could download a free app. Um, it's always nice to be able to work with adults, I think, to create these mini steps. So um, I will get to that a little later. But um, it's a nice way for kids to kind of think for themselves as well. So th these are actually sample goals that are included in the instructions. Um, so research does show that kids who set goals from themselves are actually happier and they do better uh, than those with no plans, with, with no goals that are concrete. Um, so one of the beauties of, I think, this activity is that not only is it age appropriate, but it's very concrete. So for a parent or for an adult, you can actually see what your child came up with and you can see their goals um, on paper. So there's some friends goals. It doesn't have to be fancy really, or cost much. If you wanted to make more friends, you know, you could wish them a happy birthday, you know, very simple things like this. So we tried it with some of the kids and um, the goals that some of the kids came up with um, include, so for school, um, practice their writing skills. Um, one boy said that um, 
he wanted to practice writing. And I actually include him as like a short case study at the end. Um, but he also said, you know, he will lo he loves science. Um, there were two kids who said they wanted to be faster at math. I mean, these are goals they come up with right on their own, or maybe from maybe a little bit of light prodding from their parents as well. But um, I think I thought these were beautiful goals that the kids came up with themselves. Uh, the last step is so finally using that wheel. Um, it's really the power of visualization, but also the power of drawing. So our children have speech um, issues. Um, they can they can actually um, not all of them, but some of them when they talk, it's hard to understand them or some of them, they might feel really comfortable with drawing. There was this one child who loved drawing. Um, it was the same child whose father said, I think she needs to interact with more people. I think she needs more friends. I mean, she came in with a coloring book and that's all she did. But I wanted to incorporate a part where the kids were able to express themselves through drawing as well. So in terms of the vision board, um, I included a set of crayons so that they can um, actually draw the steps that they envision uh, when they want to complete their goal. Um, so these are the next steps. Um, so I would say that until here, I think the children could do some of the things on their own, especially if they are a little older, if they're in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I think they can do this on their own a little bit, but it's always nice to be able to have a trusted adult support you. So I created, um, so this is actually um, all of the resources here that I listed. It's available available for the UH volunteers, but I thought it would be really helpful uh, to actually have like a digital resource finder uh, for the parents as well. So, um, I just thought that, you know, during COVID, some patients who never, some families who never had to ask for help, now they do need help, but maybe they might feel ashamed. Maybe we might not be getting the full picture always. It could be due to cultural cultural things. We just never know what's going on in a family. And I, I personally believe unless you're able to see the menu of options that are available to you, sometimes it's even harder to ask for help. So. Um, the navy blue um, tabs are for the adults, and then I also included some tabs um, that relate to the rainbow life activity. So if a parent wanted, was curious about, I wonder what kind of ideas there are for family things, uh, these are some family goals that are samples. Um, the same goes with extracurricular activities. This could be totally printed out and also be shown to the child as well. Um, Sometimes you don't know what, what your interest is, especially if you're young and seeing options or examples really can be helpful in fostering ideas. So this is just an ex example of the extracurricular list um, that's accessible to parents online. So this is finally a case study of a child that I was able to work with and um, support group one-on-one -on -one, uh, with my supervisor there uh, via Zoom. And um, one of the beauties of this session was that um, I saw the importance or the, the therapeutic value of being able to have this like back and forth, this conversation with a child, because the child can think that they're setting goals for themselves, but actually you're kind of maybe leading the conversation. So um, one example is, so this child expressed they want to improve their writing skills. And they also um, were huge fans of football, I found out, uh, particularly for this one um, NFL player. And so one of the ideas that I came up with was I said, would you like to maybe write to the NFL player and see if you get a response back? And he was so excited to try that idea he was all for it. And at the end of our session, he told me this was so much fun. So I think getting feedback like that, you know, is face validity. Um, you can really tell that the children really enjoy it and it's effective. Um, now, finally, I'm not sure if you can see this part, but basically the idea is um, by being conscious of the five different domains, um, you're able to 
naturally create more social supports for the children. So our children in particular have um, a bit of trouble creating this nice you know, social network, especially when once they get a little bit older, maybe they might be more isolated, maybe they have more trouble making friends. But if you volunteer, if you are more conscious of extracurricular activities, um, if you have a mental health plan, you know, if you are able to uh, see a therapist, because health could include mental health, right? Um, if you're able to like, consciously plan your activities, with the help of your mom or dad or caregiver, you're more able to kind of um, set your life up for more social supports and good people surrounding you. So I do think this framework is really nice um, in terms of helping children um, have more social supports naturally. So the summary is truly um, understanding all of the colors, understanding why it's valuable to live a full life um, with all the components, with the five domains, uh, setting goals um, in each of these five areas uh, to make sure that you're engaging in all, all of these areas um, as much as possible, and visualizing. Um, there's a lot of research that supports uh, visualization can help with goal setting um, and, and so, or meeting your goals. Um, so I wanted to also create a way for children to express themselves, especially if they're not good at writing, uh, so drawing. Um, and lastly, to be connected with an adult facilitator, if at all possible, to kind of give that child the extra push uh, to um, have social supports around them. Oh. I, I really wanted to give a very special thank you to uh, the people who believed in me. Um, and Dr. Hussey is my academic advisor. And I remember during my interview here um, as, as an incoming, hopefully fellow, um, basically he told me about the example activities that previous fellows have done. And one of the ex examples was a yoga activity to release trauma. And I thought that was so, um, just unique. And I always wondered, I wonder what kind of activity I may be able to come up with. And um, I just really appreciate Dr. Hussey for really just being a great advisor and a great professor. I really appreciate his teaching style as well. Um, and I'm so grateful for my supervisor who has believed in this activity. Not a lot of people believed in this activity, actually. I've gotten a lot of no's, but she believed in me. And um, I really appreciate that. Um, one person believing in you can really open the doors for a lot of things. This was funded by the Eno Mori Center at Case. Um, I really appreciate what I learned from my supervisor. She's very kind and she's here today. I just really wanted to say thank you so much. Um, and also my mentor, Dr. Um, Mr. Patrick Canary, thank you so much for always being the calm force in my life during my crazy academics. I just appreciate having someone to talk with. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions or feedback, I'm very open. Um, you could email me anytime, and um, that will be the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Fantastic. Questions? So, so my, I, I have a, a question. This is, um, well, two, two parts. One, um, this is really a pretty well thought out and complete type of intervention. That's very unusual. Oh, so my, my two questions are number one, do you have some sort of art background? And then number two, what are the next steps in terms of promoting this? Because it's well packaged. Yes, thank you so much for asking that. Firstly, Dr. Hasi, I appreciate that very much. Thank you for saying it's a complete activity. I will say the reason why it's complete is because my supervisor taught me the value of consulting others. So we consulted, you know, my supervisor gave a lot of input as a pediatric social worker. So one of the inputs that she made immediately was we have to make this fun and engaging for the kids. So including things like crayons, stickers, also just like 
why the children need to understand why is each category important? So having like a pediatric specialist really um, on the team is really helpful. Also, some of these children are developmentally delayed. So, I mean, this activity is a six month process. I thought of this in December, it came a long way. I wish I could show you, like I have all the pictures of like how much it has changed. But if you have a developmental delay, you won't be able to like cut the pieces neatly. You might not be able to glue things neatly. That's why we, we made it pre-made. Um, and originally we had seven categories. We really dialed it down to five. I don't have an art background, but I take I took, you know, like art therapy class, like a, I'm sorry, I took a child trauma class here and I learned about art therapy. That was like one of my art projects and um, one of my um, topics to research. So a lot of the ideas came from the team that I worked with at UH Rainbow, but also incorporating things I learned in class, books I've read. Um, that's what I'll have to say. Um, also, can you remind me the second part of your question, please, Dr. Hussey? I forgot. Uh, said. So this is so well packaged. Next steps for disseminating it, promoting yes. it? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you for asking. I hope Steve Souter is here, but, and Mitchell, Mitchell's here. Um, I am thinking of, so as you can imagine, this has taken me a lot of time um, because uh, these are all hand cut. I mean, this is like done by a stencil. The pieces are, you know, this, this is like, I had to use an, you know, stencil for all of these. It took me a long time to make. So it'll be nice if we go digital. Um, so I believe we have a de app developer here today in our presentation right now, but we'll have to see. I would love for this to be a digital product, honestly. And, um, you know, I'm very forward thinking. I love something that's sustainable as well. So that would be the next steps for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mari. Thank you. That was fantastic. Our final presenter um, this evening is uh, Olivia Walsh, and the topic of her capstone is the impact of COVID-19 on the Ohio Syringe Exchange Program. Olivia? Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so as Dr. Hussey said, and thank you all for staying. I know I'm the last one. Um, but my name is Olivia. I am uh, in the adult uh, direct practice track, um, and I did my capstone on the impact of COVID-19 on an Ohio syringe exchange program. Um, so just some background. Uh, syringe exchange programs are community-based programs where people who inject drugs can safely dispose of used needles for new sterile ones. Um, they first uh, came about in the 1980s in response to the HIV epidemic, but since then they really spread their aims and services to try to address all injection drug related risks. Um, so that could include screening and treating for bloodborne infections, uh, referrals to primary care, substance use treatment, abscess and wound care around the injection sites, um, overdose prevention, uh, and more. Uh, syringe exchange programs have been found to be a best practice for decreasing infectious diseases such as HIV, HCV, endocarditis, uh, decreasing drug use and risky injection behavior, uh, increasing substance use treatment retention and utilization, and then also improving access to primary care services. So as we all know, COVID has no boundaries in terms of uh, who it's infecting and affecting, but people who inject drugs appear to be particularly vulnerable. Uh, and that's for a number of different reasons. So uh, for one, they tend to have um, increased health risks such as poor pulmonary health, uh, weaker immune systems, and then some other socioeconomic vulnerabilities such as housing instability, lack of transportation, uh, and these have been independently associated with an increased risk of contracting COVID. We've also seen an acceleration of overdose deaths since uh, the start of COVID and psychological stress among just the general population, but a worsening of symptoms who, uh, for people who are already struggling prior to the pandemic. Uh, so 
I conducted a literature review to see how uh, COVID-19 has affected syringe exchange programs. Uh, most of what I found is descriptive right now, but it appears that at least in the United States, uh, over half of programs have had to decrease services. About 25% have had to close one or more of their sites uh, due to staff shortages um, from people contracting COVID uh, and loss of funding. So this year I interned at Circle Health Services and the Centers for Family and Children, uh, and they have a syringe exchange program. So that was the one that I focused on for my study. Uh, it opened in 1995 in response to the HIV epidemic and was the first in Ohio. It began with just two sites that were um, allocated by the city of Cleveland, uh, but has since spread. Uh, the Uptown Rocky River and LGBT Center are what we call fixed sites. So that means that they are located within clinics. Uh, the West or van location um, is kind of a hybrid model because it's, uh, it's located in the parking lot of the Cleveland Hispanic Humidop, uh, but it's mobile in that it's run out of a van. Um, and this is actually a very common model uh, because it helps people get to more hard to reach areas. For the services that they provide, they do a one-to-one -one needle exchange up to 20 needles. So however many you uh, return is what you would get back. Uh, they have safe injection uh, kits, supplies, condoms. Uh, they do HIV and HCV testing, referrals to substance use treatment, including some medication assisted treatments, uh, referrals to mental health counseling, primary care. And then they also do a naloxone distribution and training uh, two times a week through, it's called Project Dawn, and that's to help prevent overdose, uh, overdoses and overdose deaths. Uh, also, I say 0.5 because the LGBT center doesn't actually do syringe exchange, it just does uh, the HIV testing. For the methodology, this was a naturalistic case study of one program. Uh, my sample was the five staff members who run just the daily operations of the syringe exchange program. Uh, for quantitative data, I looked at monthly syringe exchange program encounters, uh, and I got that data. It's called REDCap. It's where they store all their client information. Um, and then I just spent a number of hours over a lot of different months sitting and observing, talking to the staff members, asking them questions as they came up uh, and taking notes. So it was rather informal. In terms of findings and results, I realize this is a little bit overwhelming, uh, but a lot of what I found was reflected in the literature. Uh, so pretty much all the, or yes, all of the locations experienced either reduced hours or closed completely. Um, the West location, for example, closed from March to June of 2020, reopened for a little bit, and then has been closed since January. Um, the models, process and processes, and services have all changed in various different ways. Uh, for example, they used to do HIV and HCV testing in the back of the van, uh, but of course, once social distancing measures uh, were enacted, this was no longer possible. Um, so the Hispanic Humidop gave temporary access to the porch, uh, but the staff described how on windy days stuff was flying everywhere, and then once it became cold, this wasn't an option. Uh, they're also just not the boss of that property, uh, so they don't have much autonomy over whether or not they're allowed to be there right now. At the Uptown location, some examples were uh, they're now a COVID vaccination site, so they were actually moved from their normal location into a small room in the back of the clinic uh, and can only see one client at a time. They had to pause HIV and HCV testing because the clinic didn't want people coming inside. Um, and they're really concerned about this because uh, with the HIV testing, they do a second test 90 days after the first one. Uh, so they, a lot of the staff felt that the first tests were just a waste. Um, there was also a staff shortage. So uh, one of the staff members contracted COVID and this is a, a small team, although he feels like he did not contract it while he was on the job. It meant that they had to work at home for a number of weeks, uh, leaving just one or two staff members controlling the entire thing, uh, which uh, they, they described it as they were getting completely slammed with clients. Um, on a more client level, transportation was an issue. Uh, 
the staff were particularly concerned about the clients who they normally saw at their west location and how they would come all the way to uptown, uh, particularly at a time when people were nervous about taking public transportation. Finally, in terms of external organizations uh, with the Hispanic Humidop, where the West, where the vans located, uh, they really felt that they're at a standstill right now. And this is kind of due to a perfect storm of factors. Uh, the building is falling apart from water damage, so they can't safely be on the porch. Uh, there was a leadership change, that sort of thing. Uh, and then Metro Health also runs a syringe exchange program, actually just up the road from the West location. Uh, and the staff members though had a few concerns about maybe the quality of the needles and lack of HIV testing. So in addition to the barriers, there are facilitators and some innovations that have been made that have allowed them to provide at least some services throughout this time. Uh, one major one was the opening of the Rocky River location this February, three, time, three days a week. Uh, it's located within a center's building, so they felt safer from COVID, um, and they uh, also just felt like they had more autonomy over the work that they were doing there. Um, as I said, they had that temporary access to the porch when it was warm out. Uh, one of the staff members has actually been with the syringe exchange program for over 25 years. Uh, and he believes that right now in this moment, he has the best team that he's ever worked with. Uh, many of them have substance use histories of the, uh, their own. And he feels that that helps them to empathize with clients in a non-judgmental and welcoming manner. Um, they're extremely motivated. They want to be out there. They are frustrated that they can't be at all their locations. Uh, they feel safe and protected from COVID and they feel, feel uh, supported from their internal leadership. Staff have also felt that they were provided with sufficient PPE uh, and they started handing clients new uh, materials such as hand sanitizer and ready bath cloths during the pandemic. Uh, finally, they did give the Metro Health Syringe Exchange Program a lot of props uh, because they haven't closed at all throughout the whole pandemic, uh, and they're hoping that Metro has picked up some of their clients out west. In terms of the quantitative uh, findings, um, I went back two years from when the initial shutdowns happened in March of 2020 to see if there were any patterns uh, that were occurring naturally. I didn't see any, but I include a few months prior to the pandemic, just so that you can see that, you know, there is a lot of fluctuation between months regardless. Um, a syringe exchange pr program encounter means anytime someone comes in to exchange needles. So if, a some, so if someone came in three times a month, that would count as three encounters. Uh, things that I want to highlight. So March 2020 to June 2020, uh, the van location was closed for the first time and we see a decline in encounters. Uh, in September, someone stole the catalytic converter on the van. Uh, so that was out of service for a few days, um, which might count for that little decline. And then really noticeably, uh, in December 2020, we went from about 2000 encounters that month all the way down to 788 when the mobile uh, West Van site closed for a second time, which is really concerning. Uh, on a slightly more positive note, um, there was an increase between February and March. Uh, and I'm wondering if that has to do with the opening of the Rocky River location. So recommendations, um, the staff were really interested in uh, getting a permit from the city of Cleveland to temporarily move to this uh, little grass lot across from the Hispanic Humidop uh, and set up tables outside because now it's getting warmer, some plexiglass booths. Um, one staff member mentioned maybe distributing more syringes, having a bigger van, more staff, like a full-time nurse to help with the wound care and the uh, various vaccinations. Um, and then I also gave the staff two recommendations uh, in a written report based on just the research that I found on best practices. Uh, so the first one was to at least temporarily move to a more needs-based syringe tra transaction model. So what I mean by that is um, a client could come in and they would request 
however many syringes they think that they need to have a new sterile syringe for every injection drug use, regardless of how many they exchanged or didn't exchange. Uh, this is what the CDC recommends. This is what has been found to be the most effective for uh, reducing new HIV and hepatitis C infections. The, one of the staff members said that they actually had tried this for a little bit, but it quickly became very expensive. So that's when they went back to the one from one model up to 20 needles. Uh, I'm wondering that if it's because some of their sites are closed, um, they might have more syringes just around that they're not distributing. So this might be possible in this moment. Uh, but if not, I recommended doing a one for one plus model, which just means basically coming up with a predetermined amount of extra needles that they will give every client for each visit. Uh, so if they normally give them 20, now they could give them 30. Uh, and the point of this is just really to cut down on the number of times that people are having to come in because the more they do, the more they can potentially be exposed to COVID. The second recommendation was uh, to use more of a delivery model, uh, also known as a mobile or outreach model. They have this van, uh, they've already got it uh, with them. They're extremely frustrated that they're not able to be using it right now. So uh, what a lot of programs have done that I found in the research uh, during COVID is started this more delivery model. Um, so the van could either run Rome unplanned, it could go to certain hot spots, different places at different times, they could arrange a schedule, or maybe even uh, clients could arrange uh, to have a delivery to them uh, if it's you know within a set proximity. So in conclusion, uh, I think syringe exchange programs should be considered absolutely essential. Uh, the effect of COVID on people who inject drugs compounded by the effect of COVID on syringe exchange programs it could literally be costing people their lives. Uh, the syringe exchange program st staff uh, felt that they've probably lost a few of their clients to HIV while they haven't been able to be out there and even more uh, to drug overdose deaths. Uh, syringe programs could maybe help to slow COVID. So they helped with detections through screening everyone who came through their doors initially, uh, but maybe now they could become sites for vaccinations or that, you know, a place where uh, staff members could at least help uh, clients uh, sign up to have a COVID vaccination. This study did have some limitations. So uh, it was just a case study, so it's not generalizable. It was not experimental in nature. Um, and then data collection was pretty informal. And of course it was just me. So my interpretation is just one interpretation of the findings. For future directions, I would love to see more experimental studies on harm reduction programs that are being conducted remotely. Um, and then I also think it would be really interesting to have a reassessment of the syringe exchange programs uh, now that things are opening up. So have some of those 25% of sites that had to close, have any of those been able to open back up? And then references. Uh, yeah, of course, thanks to the Circle Health staff for letting me uh, bug them with questions for a few months. Uh, Dr. Hussey, my supervisor, Alan, uh, the leadership fellows for all their input on this project, uh, my family, my friends, and the many pets that I have acquired since starting grad school. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, once again, there's that icon button at the bottom to raise your hand. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Questions, comments? Olivia, I have a sort of question comment for you. As you pointed out, this was a, a population and a program that was particularly impacted by COVID and particularly at risk, no doubt about it. Um, but you combined um, a very uh, good literature review, looking at research with this unusual role as kind of an embedded student 
intern researcher. And um, in, in very genuine ways, in very honest ways, it seemed to me that staff really gave you a lot of rich detail to supplement with the literature that you were seeing. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that process and about that unusual role that you played. Yeah, uh, it was definitely a process. I uh, had done some addiction work prior to uh, coming to Mandel. So that was the major interest of mine. And I knew that they had this syringe exchange program. So I, throughout my internship, was trying to figure out how I could figure a way to get involved. Um, so I finally badgered my supervisor enough and he connected me with them. But I showed up and none of us had any idea what the other person was really doing there. And so it was a little bit strange at first. Uh, and I went through so many different iterations of what my topic was going to be based on who I spoke with that day, based on who walked in, into the door that day. Um, but I think over time and the more days that I spent there and hour, hours that I spent there, the staff definitely warmed up a lot. And um, I didn't even know like what to ask at first. <laughs> I didn't know what types of questions to ask. Um, so it was a very iterative process, um, but a really meaningful one. At the same time, it was just really cool to be able to, to see this type of program uh, in action and to hear the insight of all the different people running it, many of which had, you know, used similar programs to this at some point in their lives, um, especially the person who had worked there for over 25 years. He had a lot to say about everything um, and a lot of opinions and so Dr. Hussey helped and the fellows helped me uh, figure out what was appropriate to include uh, in a presentation because it is something that people have a lot of opinions about, but it, they are just so passionate. So it was really cool to be able to share in that. Great. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Olivia. That was uh, actually a great example of practice-based research. So um, I do wanna thank uh, the fellows for their amazingly compelling, innovative and scholarly capstones. And also by the way, their excellent time management and Zoom presentation skills. You guys never uh, really fail to amaze me. Um, the capstones are supposed to be a culminating learning experience. And I think you can see from the depth and quality of these presentations that indeed uh, a great deal of learning has taken place. And this has truly been a resilient group because they've, they've had to go through their program um, for most of their program under these highly unusual circumstances and they actually do their capstone projects. Of course, this kind of learning doesn't take place in a vacuum, but in the context of our vibrant Mandel learning community. I deeply appreciate our wonderful mentors, my esteemed faculty colleagues, and our highly talented field advisors and supervisors for supporting the fellows over the past two years. Of course, a huge expression of gratitude to all the family members and friends who have supported the fellows in numerous ways on their educational journey. And a special final thank you to our retiring Dean, Cleve Gilmore, who's been a leader uh, for the past two decades of the school and a steadfast supporter of the Mandel Leadership Fellows Program. This concludes our eighth annual uh, Mandel Leadership Fellows capstone presentation. Next stop, graduation, May 29th. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Take care.